I, I have an immunology 101 question that I've wanted to ask you, but I haven't actually spoken to you in a few weeks. Right. The way that my understanding of the immune system, which is much more limited than yours, uh, we, we don't go walking around with armies of antibodies strolling around our system waiting for infection to strike us. Normally, we have to encounter an infection for our memory cells to trigger the type of antibodies that should be generated. Why then are we getting so surprised that we've seen a fall off in the amount of antibodies in people's systems after they get the vaccine? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah, exactly. There's the memory B cells that count really, you know. But you will see antibodies persist, say, for two or three months and then they begin to wane anyway, you know. If they wane more quickly, you're slightly concerned, say. But the big metric, of course, to use here is, is risk of disease and risk of hospitalisation going up with time, you know. So measuring the antibodies antibodies overall through months and months isn't especially useful it must be said you can actually measure the memory B cells by the way you can take they live in your bone marrow which people don't realise you can take a sample and that, that's a bit obviously tricky you will be not routinely but you can see the memory B cells are there for a persistent period of time but they, they must be waning as well gentlemen is the problem you know so over time those mem- that memory begins to go off too you see and then you lose those memory B cells is the issue there so we were getting very um, upset at waning antibodies in our system, but realistically, we should be more concerned about what's happening with those those B cells and, and the, yeah. mem- the, the memory in those cells that will prevent people from being hospitalised. Yeah, well, the, well the, the, the thing to measure is the rate of hospitalisation and severe disease. Clearly, that's the big thing to look out for. And if that goes up, that means it with someone who's vaccinated, that means the vaccine is waning and those memory responses must be petering out, you know, at least decreasing, you know. And then we know, by the way, the third shot really brings out these memory B cells and T cells and makes them even stronger, you know. And there's the other cell type, the T cell. They're very important. They instruct the B cell to make the antibodies and they're seeing loads of those with the booster, you see. And they go then and hide away in your body as memory cells and they will persist for months and months. That's why the Israelis are predicting now that that booster shot will give 10 to 12 months protection, you see. Because that memory will persist for that 10 or 12 months and then might begin to go, you see. So every winter then, you, you, the vulnerable, not everybody by any means, will be given a booster, just like the flu really is the prediction. Okay, so in other words, the boosters are working, they're being rolled out here. So what impact are they going to have on this third year of the pandemic? I suppose it's going to be divided into countries that are doing grand with the first rollout and then given boosters and countries that are still only getting around to rolling out the vaccine first of all. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's it's a startling fact that we're entering year three, isn't it? I mean, who, who'd have thought like two years ago we'd be in this situation? But the truth is now year three is about to begin. Uh, the first case is now early December 2019. Uh, they, there's a woman they think actually was in this in the infamous seafood market. That's that seems to be what's called the index case. That's based on hospital records. Early December, so now we're, we're coming up to the second anniversary, and now everybody's saying all oh, the immunologists and virologists, what will happen now in year three? Can we begin to predict it? And the good news is, I think we can in a sense because we've so much information about this virus now, and we know a lot about the disease. You can begin to predict what what might happen. The boosters will be there. Uh, they'll be widespread. Um, it will be a three shot vaccine. That's that's the uh, the prediction for definite, given that what we know now. And that third shot will give over a year's protection is the hope, you see. So that's the first thing. But you're quite right, though. The, the, the debate will move now to developing countries more and more. Remember, we've, we've always had that, of course, even, even through the last few months. And can we get the vaccine into those countries is really important, as we've said several times. Uh, and this inequity is, is the question. There was one projection. The, the Gates Foundation is saying that developed countries will get back to almost normality in 2022. Uh, incomes will be non- 90% of what they were. In developing countries, the incomes would only go to a third of what they were because of the economic problems you see. So now the focus will shift more and more into, into making sure vaccine supply is not an issue for developing countries. Um, the vaccine hesitancy issue is is being lessened somewhat by the current wave. I was speaking to a, a pharmacist yesterday who tells me that there's a lot of people coming through his door now who didn't get vaccinated the first time around, but because of the prevalence uh, of the illness and the messaging coming out, I suppose the reality that the entire population didn't drop dead when they got the vaccine, that now is the time for them to get it. Uh, that's happening here where there was already a high level of compliance. It needs to happen in other countries as well. It though, does. It? Yeah, and in America, for example, there's still a high level of hesitancy going on. And But you're right, it, it, we're now in this surge. People are seeing it. They're still you know, Obviously, if you're unvaccinated, you know there's a risk of you ending up in hospital and occupying an ICU bed. 
and then you can prevent that by taking the vaccine. That seems to be registering with some of the people who are hesitant, for example. So, And of course, um, in some countries, John, the debate about the year three, by the way, is should we force vaccines on people if this hesitancy persists? That's a very tricky thing. And, and Mike Ryan, as you may have seen yesterday, said, don't do that. That's the last resort here, you know. Still just, it's all about cajoling and trying to convince people to take up the vaccine. And as you say, it is beginning to work. I mean, there's very encouraging signs in Europe anyway that, that the level of vaccination is still happening in the unvaccinated are, are turning up more and more. And let's hope that continues. Uh, there, there are various accounts on social media that I've blocked um, because they, they panic at the first sign of anything new. And there, there's one guy in particular, and if I see him coming up my timeline, I, I just ignore him because he seems to panic over everything. And there are new variants being reported. I think there's one in Africa, in yeah. Botswana, in South Africa, that they're concerned about. But like everything else, we're concerned about everything until we have something to worry about. So are we developing new vaccines that will anticipate or potentially you know, deal with the type of mutation or change yep. that we think COVID might have next. We are. There's a huge amount of new vaccines coming down the, the track, Jonathan. I mean, they're talking about a massive glut of vaccines in the middle of 2022 in terms of supply with the regular vaccine that we have. So they're, they're using this word glut. And then in the meantime, they're making new ones, you know. And there's one by a company called Valneva that we've spoken about before. That could be a pan-coronavirus vaccine that will treat any variant, which would be tremendous. They're making what are called multivalent uh, v- vaccines, which have combinations of coronavirus is in. They're going to add the flu vaccine into the coronavirus vaccine which again is a useful thing. And then people often ask me this about um, newer technologies. They're making vaccines that can be done with a patch instead of an injection. They're making vaccines that can be inhaled instead of an injection. That, that, can, that can be very beneficial to people. The inhaled ones may stop the virus in your nose as well as in your lungs and that'll stop transmission. So in other words, they're, we're getting to vaccine two point whatever. You know, the, these newer vaccines will be even better than the ones we've had. A really important one is they're able to freeze dry the vaccine now and that sounds unusual that means you can make it into a powder and you don't need to worry about these cold temperatures remember remember, remember the panic when we had to to get these ultra cold freezers that'll probably go away because you can now make them into a powder and then reconstitute them with a liquid the state will be putting them on done deal in a few months that's what it looks like we're talking about uh, the latest estimate I heard I was talking to someone yesterday in, in the vaccine business 30 billion doses will be made in the next year you know and that's an amazing number of vaccines. The question then becomes getting it into developing countries. This is called the last mile problem, by the way. Many, many medicines mm. can't make it into the places you want because it's just remote, you know. That last mile issue will be prevalent now as well in, in developing countries. Uh, but, the, but in other words, this is all in hand is the way to think of it. People are examining these things. Now, 